Good morning and a very, very warm welcome to worship. We're joined today by the people you can see here on the screen. So warm welcome to Neil and Ewan and to Stella, all of us taking part in worship today. So before we go to our time of worship, let's go around our neighbouring parishes and find out what's going on in our neighbours areas. Neil, coming to you first. <laughs> How are things and what's going on? <laughs> thank you, Sheila. Yes, at Kintor, all is well. Uh, we're still um, speaking to various folks about our, the use of our halls, so that's starting up again. Um, our services continue as normal. I guess we're, we're, in a sense, beginning to wind down for, uh, for the summer. We head into summer services once the, the schools are on leave, um, so we're, we're just finishing up various things there. Um, but the big news this week uh, is that the First Minister has said we may sing. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to see, I'm not sure quite how it's going to work in our, our services for this, this Sunday, um, but certainly our in-person services um, from, from now on, we will be able to sing, um, still behind masks, um, but I think there'll be quite a few folk who will be, be happy to do that. Um, I also want to say something about capacity, the way that that's changed, because for funerals, certainly, and weddings, uh, the capacity for churches has increased to 100 people from 50. Um, but just to note, that is dependent on the size of the building. So in our case at Kintour, it doesn't make a, a big difference. I think it means we can get an extra four. We can squeeze another four people in just because of the number of seating positions we have. Um, but it does mean that, there's, that things are easing up a little bit. Excellent. That sounds like like good news. I hope you're in good voice, Neil. How good is your singing? <laughs> you were busy before we went on camera there. You were reminding us to turn off the microphones. Well, I've heard some of the recordings of myself singing and it's 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 not a, a thing of beauty. <laughs> we will wait and see. We will let you know next week how well you did and and give you the, the score out of 10. You and how are things over with including Money Musk? Well, things are just taking over. We're actually starting to type down towards our summer services. We never thought at one point that we'd be able to go back to our usual pattern in July and August of joint services. So in July, we worship in Money Musk and in August, we worship in Cluny. And we thought with all the restrictions, we wouldn't be able to uh, fit the people in but the numbers are, are they're not picking up brilliantly yet in, in either church but the fact that we can now use the galleries means that we can fit two congregations in together um, if need be so we're looking forward to that step towards normality also singing I'm looking forward to singing but the it's going to be quite complicated and that I understand that ministers have to put masks on before they sing even though they, they lead the worship without a mask, they've got to the, then mask up because when Neil, for example, belts out his voice and uh, the, 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 the virus could spread everywhere if he was carrying anything. So we've got to put masks on. So on and off, on and off is going to be a bit of fun, uh, especially with microphones and various things. But on Sunday, we're actually starting, or I'm actually starting uh, a new 12 part or 13 part series of sermons. Uh, normally I do a, a, a summer series away from lectionary, but it's starting earlier because for some reason or other, and you might be able to tell me after Sunday how it works, I'm starting to do a 13 week series on the, the minor prophets. Uh, we don't look at the minor prophets very often. So that's the 12 minor prophets plus a week of introduction. So that starts on Sunday. I hope that doesn't put people off coming, uh, but uh, time will tell. But apart from that, everything's just ticking over and uh, we are looking forward, I think, to the singing part to be able to participate again. We have been doing more responses and more uh, pr praying the Lord's Prayer on Sundays so people are used to speaking my masks and I'm sure singing will be just the same. Anyways, there's something to look forward to. It's a step in the right direction uh, to, to to normality. So I think that's all that's happening with us. So thanks for asking. Huge step towards normality. So Blair Daff, Chapel of Geary, Stella, how are things over with well, you? I think I like that expression that you and just used, ticking over is, is lovely. Um, we're going to be back in church um, 
the Sunday at the same time as the service um, with the Reverend John Mack. So we'll be looking forward to that and singing. Um, I think we'll continue to use some of the glorious choirs that we've enjoyed in YouTube and keep them coming along to join with us in worship because it does helps to get people to sing out when there's someone else singing out um, alongside. So we'll be um, enjoying that as, as an early sweetener and um, reward for us. Um, the other thing we'll be reporting on is the plant sale, which we hope to have on the Saturday, um, just in my garden with some of the plants being donated. So we've had a roaring success so far. We've raised over £350 on dahlias and tomatoes, just about on their own. Um, so thank you to everyone who's contributed plants um, so far, and we hope to have a, a wee boost to church funds to report on next week. And by this time next year, Stella as well, hopefully that amount will be an even greater amount. But I'm sure it's something that the parishes round about and all our gardeners would love to support as well. Yeah, well, teas and scones were always uh, added on to that and um, in the village hall, but we'll get there next time. It was just a bit too, too soon to, to call a sale, but maybe an autumn produce one might be a good idea mm -hmm. if all the restrictions are lifted. Well, we look forward to joining, joining you. Certainly, if there's tea and scones, then I think that probably that's the deal. That's that would the deal be well deal. and truly made. <laughs> well, things in, in Echt and Midmar are also ticking along, just like in Blair Daft Chapel of Geary. We have our, our part time organist that visits us from time to time. She's coming on the 13th, not, not this week, but we're looking forward to having her back with us a week on Sunday and, and of course like everybody else in the country I think singing has been one of the, the greatest misses in worship so we're really looking forward to that this week um, and we will see how that goes. So whether you are joining us today as part of our community online and we know that there are people from all sorts of parts of the country that join us online. Please know of a very, very warm welcome as you join us in worship. And likewise to those members of our communities in Echt and Midmar, Clooney and Moni Musk, Kintour, Kemney and Blair Daff, Chapel of Geary. A very warm welcome. Let us worship God. Thank you for joining with us for worship today. Wherever you are and wherever you're watching this, may God be with you. My call to worship today comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm number 29. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory, the God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. So shall we worship our powerful, majestic, yet loving God as we join together in our opening prayer? And if you would like to, I have a response. So when I say the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. If you would like to, can you respond and the distant shores rejoice? I will say these words as we go along so that you can follow with me. Shall we pray? The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. And we say, and distant shores rejoice. You who spoke this world in motion, breathed life into each creature, painted landscape in colourful hues, you are our God. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, and distant shores rejoice. You who bring to each season light and warmth, rain and sunshine, and within the seed a spark of life, you are our God. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, and distant shores rejoice. You whose love is beyond measure, and stretches throughout time from a garden in Eden to a garden at Gethsemane and beyond. You are our God. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad and distant shores rejoice. 
By the word of our Lord the heavens were made. By the Spirit of our Lord was life begun. By the wisdom of our Lord his laws were laid. By the love of our Lord was born his Son. By the grace of our Lord humankind was saved. By the power of our Lord the victory was won. Creator God, forgive our moments of ingratitude the spiritual blindness that prevents us from appreciating the wonder that is in this world, the endless cycle of nature of life and death and rebirth. Forgive us for taking without giving, reaping without sowing, opening our eyes to see, our lips to praise, and our hands to share. May our feet tread lightly on the path we tread, and our footsteps be worthy of following, for they led for they lead to you. We bring this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hear the word of God, firstly from the scripture of the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, reading from verses 8 to 15. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And turning now to the scripture of the New Testament, we read from the second of St. Paul's letters to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 13 to the first verse of chapter 5. Paul writes, It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Let us pray. Loving Father, open our ears, our hearts and our minds and may the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, Amen. How many times, I wonder, have you heard that cry? But that's not fair. We so often associate it with children. They got more sweets than me. You always blame me for everything. Why do I have to empty the dishwasher? I did it yesterday. That's not fair. And as the caregivers, the response may well be, well, tough, life's not fair. But is that true? If we believe in a God who is loving and just, then how can we turn round and say that life isn't fair? And what would it take to make life fair? Over the centuries, Many have tried to impose their brand of fairness on those around them. 
Karl Marx in the 19th century rejected the ideas of a capitalist society in favour of the equal sharing of wealth amongst the people. Now in theory this sounds wonderful, everyone is treated equally, no one has more than anyone else, so theoretically there would be no need for crime, a true utopian society. I can absolutely see the appeal. However, countries such as Russia and China demonstrate that communism doesn't open up freedoms in practice. Never being able to better yourself, not having any motivation to work that little bit harder, assigned a job with no hope of progress. It doesn't create, create an idyllic society. It has a tendency to create a hopeless one. Of course, there is also the issue within this that all may be equal, but some are definitely more equal than others. This experiment, if it could be called that, in utopian living, I would say has been a resounding failure. So why didn't it work? What was missing? Is it right that some have others, uh, some have everything and others have nothing? Is that the way the world is meant to function? Well, figures from 2019 show that in the USA, there are nearly six million millionaires or richer. There are also 5.3 million people who classify amongst the poorest in the world. One of the richest nations of the world. Here in the UK, we do live in a richer country as well, but we have an advantage in that we have a reasonable health care and social support system in place. Now, it's far from perfect. Many are kept out of abject poverty because of it, but we have no situation in which we can rest on our laurels. There are far too many people who slip through the gaps. And let's face it, we only have to wander the streets of Aberdeen to see people who through circumstances have ended up living on the streets, begging for the basics. Where is the justice and fairness in that? Now, I always title my sermons, and this one I've entitled God is Just. So after everything I've said, how can I support this claim? Let's turn to our reading from Genesis. In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve everything they required. They had each other for company. He gave them food in beautiful surroundings. And they had an open relationship with God. They met with God regularly. It was idyllic. It was perfect. So why on earth, in that perfect setting, did God put a tree which they weren't allowed to touch? If they weren't meant to touch it, surely it would be better if it wasn't there in the first place? It's a bit like putting sweets in front of a two-year-old and saying, now don't touch. As soon as your back is turned, the likelihood is that those sweets will get eaten. So was that a fair thing for God to do? At some point, they were going to try it. That's human nature. So was he setting them up for failure? Well, that doesn't sound very just. But in fairness, they were warned not to touch it. So when they did what they were not supposed to do, they knew that there would be consequences for their actions, and that was why they hid. Now, it would be very easy to read the next part of this passage as God rejecting them, throwing them out in their ear, and not caring what happened to them next. But that's not what happened. They did have to face the consequences of their actions, that much is very true. They couldn't live in true community with God because they had disobeyed him. But before he turned them out, he made clothes for them. He told them how to live off the land, tilling the ground, sowing the seeds. And he told them to be dependent on one another. These are not the actions of a God in a blind fury who doesn't care. 
He exercised his justice because he must. But he also ensured that they were cared for and provided for. When we look at the world around us, it's very tempting to think that material wealth is evidence of God's favour. And when I spoke earlier about the unfairness and the distribution of global wealth, I ask, is that the best way to measure justice and fairness? Now, there is a gospel. Strangely enough, it has a tendency to be one preached in more affluent countries. And this would say that material goods are a reward for faith and that you can measure the faithfulness of an individual by looking at their bank balance. Because God rewards his people. This prosperity gospel is nothing new. And if we look at the book of Job, we find a similar theme when his friends and family tell him that he must have been very sinful to have lost everything in the way in which he did. Well, I don't know about you, but I struggle to find anything in the teachings of Jesus which point to goodness being rewarded with material wealth. In fact, I would say quite the opposite. And when we judge fairness and justice in the world of, in the terms of money or goods, are we maybe missing the point slightly? Equality and fairness are not the same. There is that cartoon about education which has been doing the rounds on Facebook again recently and it basically says if you compare a monkey, an elephant and a fish by their ability to climb a tree, then the elephant and the fish are not going to come out of that exam very well. And it's the same with the rest of life. Justice doesn't mean that we all have the same experience or that we're all treated in the same way. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he was acknowledging that our human experiences can often be very different. That following Christ wasn't a comfortable journey and it didn't guarantee an easy life. What we could do, however, was to hold on to the hope of an eternity with God. We know that on more than one occasion, Paul speaks about the thorn in his flesh, some physical impairment which he had prayed to have taken from him, but he hadn't been healed. Now, we don't know the nature of this. There have been various suggestions put forward over the years, including things like epilepsy or an issue with his sight. But whatever it was, it made life a bit more complicated for him. This wasn't because God couldn't heal him. We know that God can heal. He healed others. Paul concluded that God didn't heal him to remind him that he needed the power and strength of God to do what he was called to do. And that had he been healed, he may have been tempted to trust in his own strength and abilities instead. Now, I want to be careful at this point. There are people in the world who do not have enough food. There are people in the world who do not have clean water. There are people in the world who are dying of preventable illnesses. We have the knowledge and the resources in the world in order to make sure everybody is fed, everybody has clean water, and everybody should have access to good medical care. That's not what I'm talking about here. That is justice, keeping everybody in the world safe. What I'm talking about is that our overall life experience will be very different from that of other people. And when we are in conversation with others, particularly with people who question Christ, who are questioning their Christian faith, the subject of justice and fairness will come up a lot. It might be, why does that young mom have cancer? Why was that child allowed to die? Why are there natural disasters? Why didn't God stop the planes from going into the towers in 9-11? Where was God in this tragedy or that tragedy? Well, there are lots of glib answers from don't question God's will. It's all a divine mystery. You just didn't have enough faith. It's a punishment from God. But none of these answers satisfy. Let's take the example of the Twin Towers in 2001, 20 years ago, would you believe it? 
There were many people who felt that God had maybe saved them or their loved ones. But that leaves us with the question, why would God save those people and not the others? What was special about them? I heard a Jewish rabbi speaking about this and what he said I found so powerful. If you can look into the eyes of someone who's lost a loved one and say that you believe that God saved you, but chose not to save that other person. That God went round to pick and choose who would suffer and who wouldn't in that situation. Then at least you're honest. But that's not the God I worship. That's not justice. That's more like the roll of a dice. But that leaves us with many questions. Many of which start with why. Why do I suffer? Why is there pain and loss in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? And I'm sure you can fill in the blanks with experiences from your own lives. And if you're hoping to get an answer this morning, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. That same rabbi from New York he also said it isn't his place to answer the questions which people have about fairness and justice. His role, and I would say the role of all faith leaders, is to help the people find a way to hold the questions. Every glib answer I give you will fall short. I can't tell you why some lived and some died on that awful day. I can't tell you why a volcano erupted and killed so many people in the Democratic Republic of Congo just a couple of weeks ago. I have no answer as to why a young mum contracts cancer and dies. Why this loving couple cannot have children and a drug addict has given birth to a baby who has to go through heroin withdrawal. It makes no sense. And no, it isn't fair. But we were never promised fear. In our reading this morning, Paul said, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So when we are filled with questions about injustice and unfairness in the world, may we remember that we don't have access to that big picture. We cannot know or understand the mind and heart of God. That doesn't mean we can't do our own small bit to help injustice in the world. We can do our bit to make sure that people have access to medical care, fresh water, food, these things. I'm not saying that that is not important. It is very important and it is part of what we need to do. But when it comes to the other questions about why people are in the situations they are in, just remember we don't always have to have an answer. What we have to do is have faith and trust in the eternal living God who is just and fair. He will provide us with the resources that we need, whatever our journey through this life looks like. So trust in him. That his will be done in all things. Amen.
Let us offer to God our prayers for the world. Let us pray. We pray, Lord God, for the people who have helped us along life's road. Those who have nurtured us and cared for us. Those who have taught us and trained us. Those who have embraced and emboldened us. For them all, Lord God, we pray. We pray for those who have a trouble road to travel. Those who find themselves lonely and friendless. Those who find themselves frail and faltering. Those who find themselves angry and aggrieved. Those who find themselves frightened and fearful. Those who find themselves disgruntled and dissatisfied. Those who find themselves empty and desolate. For them all, Lord God, we pray. We pray for those who cannot see the treasures they have, treasures that come from those around them, treasures that come from you. For them all, Lord God, we pray. Let us continue to pray using the words that Jesus gave to us. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we leave this sacred space this morning, may we know in our hearts that God is loving and just, and that he will give us all that we require to follow him through a lifetime of faith. May God's blessing, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us all. Amen. <laughs>